als etwas happig. Und ihr seht, alle sind so deprimiert aus. Machen wir jetzt. Now for something yet different. Now you actually have to say something. Okay, we're going to answer the following question that I have, wanting to have been thinking about. This is cocktail party neuroanatomy. And I was inspired by this little exercise by, because, again, because Dan mentioned in his talk at the beginning this very cool paper by uh, Herculano Husel on a, a very interesting and fun paper to read. I recommend it. And the exercise we will now do for the interactive part you're going to solve. And the question is, how many neurons are in the primary auditory cortex of the human? Begin. It's like guessing how many jelly beans are in the jar. Yes. So this is a wisdom of the crowds thing. So, so and I, I will call on individual people and bring them to the board. So let's try to figure out, okay, so we're obviously we're going to estimate this. So let's try to figure out cocktail party stuff about the, I want to know because the auditory cortex is an interesting place, but how many cells are in there, okay? Ten, but, okay, that's, I'd like actually a reason though. So, so why don't we start with some, you know, let's really go cocktail party. How many, what's the current estimate for number of neurons? 86 billion. Well, what is it? Just total number of neurons right now. So what do we, can we get convergence on that? So we've got... 10 to the 11th, of which 10 to the 12th in the cerebellum. Okay, you're, you're, not, you're not playing though. You're not playing the game. You're not, unless you're going back for a degree. So there's a, okay, so we have, a, we have some candidate numbers. So 86, for instance, 86 billion. It's 42. <laughs> 42 is correct, gold star. We have a winner, 42. <laughs> okay, so how are we gonna estimate this? So should we start, okay, so let's start with total number. Okay, so it, where does that number come from, 86 billion? 86 billion, okay. That's, that's a big number among friends. How many stars are there in the Milky Way? How many stars are in the Milky Way galaxy? Billions and billions. So they estimate 100 to 200 billion, actually. Much more. Hey, no, Fisher. Geek. <laughs> okay, now, so where, how is this comprised? Where, where do these live? And, and, and uh, professors of neurobiology can't play. <laughs> okay, you can, you can pay Dan, but you can't. <laughs> so let's try. So how, do, how are these distributed? So first of all, is this the number of neurons, or what about there's other kind of cells? What about those? Yeah, those are good. Those are all cool. So are there some more? You're like, huh? <laughs> Estimates, guesses? This is a neuroscience conference. I don't know if it's just astronaut, but so should the number be copied? Okay, so, so what am I writing down? <laughs> Come on, you wusses. <laughs> Let's go, you gotta play. What is it, right? Is it one? I mean, Simon's looking it up in the paper, so he's like. <laughs> <laughs> What's the rate? Is it 4 every 3 I mean, th these, are, these have varied widely, right? So, I mean, it depends on which period. So, let's look, it's gonna be a big number on the same order of magnitude. So, I mean, so for instance, the Herculano paper says 85. Uh, that's fine. So we're not, we're not going to worry about those right now because Jesus Christ, this, we don't understand them very well. Let's worry about these. Let's say this is an estimate, uh, but how do these distribute anatomically? Where are these things? Where in the brain? It's a big place. Well, it's not a big place. It's only yay big, right? So there's 86 billion neurons. Let's say we're going to take this estimate for now. Let's work with this because it's a it's a reasonable recent one. Okay. So where how so for instance, let's take the tiny cerebellum. 
How, how many of them are living in the cerebellum? <laughs> okay, Luis, demerit. <laughs> no, you can look it up. You should look it up, guys. Come on, it's not, this is a, you, you, look at the paper. Look at some other papers. So this is surprising. This this is a, this should now surprise you. This is actually a weird and amazing fact about about the brain. So where how do you think these things? So let's take three. Let's just split it into three different areas. Okay. Let's say brainstem because that's a part of the brain you don't want to leave home without. Brainstem, cerebellum, cortex. Okay. How do? Let's take these three parts of the head. How is this going to shake out? How many in the brainstem? Kind of an important part. <laughs> Look, let me ask you, how are you going uh, uh, to approach this problem? Think of this as an SAT problem. How are you going to actually, let's say we're starting with this number, how are you going to answer the question, how many cells are in auditory cortex? How are you actually approaching this problem, other than looking it up? The answer isn't anywhere to be found, by the way. I mean, you have to actually go through this exercise <laughs> to get an estimate. So, so it's about a billion, right? A billion here. Okay, well, that's, that's good between friends. That's like a Trump kind of number. <laughs> but now we go to the Gates kind of numbers. <laughs> so how many in cortex, how many in cerebellum? <coughs> So of the 85 billion that are left, 21. <laughs> so which website are you on? Ah, and which, what's the paper? Yeah, that's the right paper. <laughs> it's a very useful paper. Okay, so what's, so this number is going to be huge, yeah. right? And this number is going to be on the order of, in that paper, it's 16 billion, for instance. Which leaves how many for here? If it's 86 total, we can do this, come on. <laughs> you haven't, you've had coffee, guys. How much is left now? 69. It's a good number, too. All right. Thank you very much. OK. So already, this should blow you away, that there's, of this, that there's 69 billion cells compared there compared to there. Isn't that amazing? Like for cocktail party factoids, you should know this kind of stuff. It will be on your exam. OK, so what's the next step? So now we have an estimate. We're talking about auditory cortex. So what, what number do we take now? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Somebody's alive. <laughs> okay, and now, okay, and now, what's the next step? So we have, we're, we're calculating, we're assuming there's 16 billion total. Now we have, now we have to figure out what, ne what other numbers do we need to calculate this? Should we be dividing tools? Surface or like? Surface. We want to know how how much surface is there actually in cortex. What's an estimate of that? I mean, it's. So look, I mean, you clearly need to <laughs> go to some of these websites and just you know amuse yourselves. What do you think? Okay, so surface area. Is about. Yes. Okay. Okay, so far, so, so okay, that's good. Now what? Yeah, let's, let's hold off on that one for a moment. So we'll, we'll if the auditory cortex is 10 centimeters, like 10 square centimeters? Well, okay, yeah. yeah. Let's, so let's first of all get some more estimates. That's a bit... Yeah. Can I just say but, that's about the size of a... But that is millimeters, right? That's the size of a what? Of a pillowcase. Yes, 
It's like a pillowcase and then, and then squished together. That's the thing, like taking a brain and unfolding it and squishing it is like a, you know, a nice big napkin at an elegant restaurant or apparently in uh, Simon's house, pillowcases. Okay, so that's the surface area of the total. So now we know the total number of cells plus some area. Now we need a few extra. So for instance, um, what did I else did I want you to do? So there's a couple of other numbers that I've, you know, that you, so it depends. So for instance, let's look at, it's more useful to look at this in terms of square millimeters because it relates more to anatomic units that we, you know. So let's divide, what, what's that number going to be? So if we take this divided by that, how many cells, if we use this calculation, because that actually starts to get to some measurable things where there's actually disagreement in the literature. I mean, sensible disagreement. So this is like 65,000, right? So 65,000 cells per square millimeter. Gesundheit. Okay. Now, that's what comes out if you just make an estimate of, you know, then, now, is there a literature on this? Well, there is, because people actually grind up brains and count. And it turns out that there, the estimates differ quite substantially. So for instance, a recent paper that, you know, they do this stuff, basically they grind up a slice of brain and count the cells automatically, comes out roughly with, you know, the, let's say the grinder method, which is not nice sounding, but it's also a dodgy website. Um, so the grinder approach comes to 65,000. Um, if you actually, a, a recent NISL, just using a NISL approach, they get a much higher number, they get about 120,000. So there's, there's pretty, you know, there's variation, it's off by a factor of two, but there's interesting variation in the number of cells, okay? So far, so good? So let's just, let's split the difference, let's say 100,000. So we've got 100,000 cells per millimeter square. And we're going to just assume that that's basically a column about, let's say, four millimeters or something. Now we need to know how big is auditory cortex. So can we estimate that? Well, that's actually, that itself turns out to be tricky because there's so many different approaches to classifying it. And so the Professor Zillis is not here, but there's a very uh, you know, useful, influential paper for many by that group, but one by Rademacher on actually estimating using the Vogt analysis of you know, one area TE, 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, and so on. And a reasonably good estimate of, can we go further here? No, I guess not. Did you all download this paper yet? Okay, good. So you can make an estimate of how big a uh, primary, did he estimate the total? Yeah, it's about, um, well, uh, they estimated in cubic millimeters, so 1,600, so TE, so this is primary auditory, co auditory cortex is big, has many different areas, like visual. So. Primary, secondary? Only primary now, area TE1 in that definition is, uh, what is it, 1,600 or something like that? 16, so in their estimate, 1,600, cubic millimeter. So what's the surface area? <laughs> I don't like it, I don't math. <laughs> <laughs> okay, math guys. <laughs> well, that's a 400. Huh? Shape, that's a Four, uh, 400. That's about. So let's just be uh, between, you know, a gen gentle person's agreement. So this area, they estimate, this is a probabilistic estimate over, I think, several hundred brains. So they are very careful about the anatomy. They do individual tracing of, you know, doing this TE1, TE2, and so on. Then they have a nice probabilistic atlas of the sizes and the numbers, and they estimate. So it's on the order of 400 millimeter square of primary auditory cortex. Okay, this is pretty small. It's like, you know, it's teeny. It's like a dime, it's a small coin. That's the size, so compared to primary visual cortex, it's really small. And then how many cells, approximately? 
<laughs> we can do this. Somebody has a calculator? Thank you very much. It's about <laughs> okay, so the estimate is about 40 million cells. Okay, 40 million cells in primary auditory cortex. So is that big or is that small? Small, small. for a big job. Small for a big job. <laughs> exactly. So, so how many cells are, uh, how many um, output cells are in the cochlea? So what about the number of inner hair cells, for instance? I mean, what's the divergence here? I mean, what's the magnification factor? from here, let's say, to the colliculus and the cortex. Well, it's enormous, right? So the estimate at the output stage, at the periphery, is about 30,000. So it's much fewer channels, right? So the, in, so the encoding at the periphery, right? this is what we're talking about, right? So when you start out, the initial encoding of the signal, of all these features of the signal, is at a surface that gets an analysis that only has basically sends out 30,000 wires. So you get, and out of those, the representation at that periphery has to be interesting enough to get all this junk out of it, or incredibly important perceptual attributes. <laughs> and then it goes up the food chain and the brainstem and it ends up with this number. So from that point of view, it's pretty big. But if you compare it to visual cortex, it's teeny. Visual cortex has, you know, it's three or four times the size primary visual cortex. So this, this is the kind of, you know, elementary numbers that we don't know how to use that yet, but if you're really computationally inclined, you can begin to exploit this kind of knowledge, right? You can figure out, well, what are the likely sources of convergence, divergence? These are just simple numerical little exercises. Okay? You're just like, oh my god, there's math. Nobody told me there was math in this class. <laughs> So I calculated myself, sort of not knowing, not looking up too much, about 60 million that over, but that's, it's this order of magnitude. That's the number of cells in primary auditory cortex. It's, it's a pretty, pretty useful thing to know. You guys should definitely know these numbers. It's embarrassing. Because at cocktail parties, or you don't go to cocktail parties. Parties? <laughs> you should be able to do this kind of stuff. Okay. You guys are supposed to be interactive, not like exhausted. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Well, now as punishment, I'm going to give you, I'm going to continue talking about <laughs> the punitive part of the lecture. So I want to go back to apparently nothing. Yeah. But since you're so exhausted, I'll give you just a ton of examples to keep it nice and easy. So let's go back to the perceptual problem that you face. Right, so I told you all these things that you have to encode with those 30,000 things at the periphery. All this information plus actual speech information. So here's the sentence. Cats and crocodiles don't play together, which is true. And when I went to school, the way we learned how to deal with this is you made a spectrogram, right? So there's time and frequency. And this uh, then you learn to go from left to right, and you look in great detail, and you learn about things like the formants of speech sounds, you know, look at the broadband bursts, energy bursts, and there's things like voicing, you say, oh, this is probably part of a vowel, and so on, and you read this from left to right in little slices of time, and then you get the output. That was the idea, and that's actually still how automatic speech recognition is done. It's done on actually very short slices of time about 20 millisecond windows that slide across. That's how it's to implement. Now, there's of course other parts of the signal, hard to ignore. Like if here's, here's what the ear actually gets. This is the waveform, look at the envelope of this, right? so the energy envelope, a lot of interesting information in this kind of big ups and downs. And the question is, does that matter? I mean, is, just, is that just extra stuff or do you actually use it and should you care about it? Should you care about this very local information and this more coarse information. So let's think about what you have to do. Well, in one thing you have to do when you recognize speech is you sure as hell want to recognize words, right? But to recognize words, you need to actually get the local order of the items correctly. Because if you get the local order wrong, you get the item wrong, so that's not helpful. <laughs> 
So for instance, pests versus pets is um, you know, pretty similar, but it's a distinction with a difference, although pets are pests. Or custom, custom, bat, tab, bar, bar, fool, fool, all these things. So you have to get the local order correctly to have successful lexical access. What does it mean? It means that the resolution in the time domain has to be high enough to get all this stuff in its correct slot, so that when you look it up in your dictionary, you're going to the correct entry. Okay, that's cool, and that's basically what's called segmental, it's a segmental part of phonology, segmental and subsegmental phonology, so the detailed things, the local details. But there's also long stuff, so for instance, the syllabic scale matters a ton. The syllabic scale carries all kinds of uh, information, such as, you know, for instance, the prosodic things, go away, or going to essen, or if you speak a tone language, maybe. Ma, 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 ma. Right. So those are four different words. Um, that has to be. They have. To, but that tonal variation has to be carried by something. It has to be carried such that you can then interpret it as a different word, like horse, hemp, scold, and mother. Um, okay. So the granularity in time actually has specific perceptual consequences. You can't just have the small stuff and the big stuff, you actually need both. And so, you know, this can remind you of another similar problem. So look at this picture. It's made up out of little squares, very attractive colors, you know, everything, every little square has its own little pattern, its own little color, and you can look, you know, look sideways, you can look up down, you can see very nice things, but when you look at the whole picture, you see Chuck Close in a self-portrait. And so um, in the visual domain, you have to do a similar thing, right? Is you have to be able to analyze the local detail, but you also have to look at the global configure information to get a different kind of thing. Now, they're related, but they're not identical. They carry different sorts of information that you have to actually pull out, right? So, this, so you can see and the intuition is pretty clear. And in the time domain, it's a little less clear. So, what you, so how would you do it? Well, as information is coming at you, you have to absorb it, but you have to integrate it somehow. You have to decide how much information do I actually use to have a simple representation. So you have to have some form of temporal integration, and that's what I want to talk about a little bit. So temporal integration, how is that supposed to work? Well, here's a stimulus. The stimulus goes on, turns on for a while, and then turns off. Your ear, or your, you know, the, or your auditory brain, has to somehow integrate the information to then form a judgment about what it is. So the typical model of this is basically what's called leaky integration. So you have a pretty long temporal integration window. It just, uh, information comes in and you get, you know, you get what you get. But it's a long temporal window. Now, what's, what's good about having a long temporal window? If you have a lot of information that you collect. Well, you have a lot of resolution in one sense. You have, for instance, a lot of resolution in frequency. If you have a lot, like, ma, to be able to tell that there's this nice frequency shift, you have to have enough in the signal to say, to recognize the frequency shift, because it could be very small frequency. So that's good. So I like this. So far, so good. We want to have long integration windows because they have the right kind of properties for perception. But suppose you only had that. What would you lose? Well, if you only have long windows, you don't have the right temporal resolution, so you don't get the local details right. So you must also have something much more detailed, so maybe you actually sample a stimulus much more fine-grained like this. So as the stimulus comes in, you take little snapshots or punctate, you sample it at a very high rate. You go chop, 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 chop. The most famous model is this by Neil Wiemeister. It was called the multiple looks model. So these are you know, very popular, widely cited, and the idea is, well, you likely need to do something like this, like look at something very fast, but if you only do that, then you don't get the long scale out, because you can't actually get something like, for instance, a high frequency resolution out of a long window, out of a short window, but if you have only a long window, you don't get the temporal resolution, so you're screwed either way. So how do you solve this? Well, in an engineering case, you solve it simply by having a multi-resolution system. And so what I have been thinking about and trying to sometimes even work on is that this is what you do with the auditory case. So here's the sentence, this paper is hard to publish, which was true. 
And um, the suggestion I've advanced over, and I keep coming back to it over the years, is that you actually you sample the input at a very high rate, let's say on the mean 25 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, something like that, that is you, as the signal comes in, you go chop, 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 chop. And you do the same thing on a much longer scale. You also integrate over much longer windows of, on the order of 200 milliseconds. So you also go chop, chop, chop. So now you get two views of the same signal. So you have short integration windows, and you have long integration windows. And here's the, you know, here's the window metaphor made more cheesy. Right, so you look at the same signal through little slices or through big slices. Now this should remind you um, of the little example I gave you way at the beginning of the reverse speech. So remember in the reverse speech, if I had small windows up to about 50 milliseconds and I reversed them, you didn't pay any cost. That is, your intelligibility was at ceiling, it was perfect. But if the window was on this order, you were, you know, you had zero intelligibility. So there's something going on at these scales that we have to get our head around. Now, to give you, you know, yet another view of this, it's like thinking, it's like looking at the same word. So here's me speaking, some, saying something about dishes, I believe. And one time you look at it through a very high time resolution, so you can see the vertical stripes, a very high resolution, that's the glottal pulse, actually. So you're re resolving the glottal pulse. Here you see the same thing through a high frequency resolution. Right? So the time resolution is not very good anymore. But you can see each, you know, you can see the harmonic stack completely there. And the claim is you actually need both representations to get the correct thing. So for me to say, you know, coffee, you have to actually get the word coffee right, and you need temporal resolution to achieve that goal. But for you to understand that it's a question and that there's a rising pitch because the pitch change is very small, you also need to have that independently. And you cannot derive one from the other. So it follows that you must be doing both. That's the, that's the conjecture. So to give it a more you know, cartoonish flavor, usually when you think about time, you think about the arrow of time, like Newton, which is like this. Time, you know, absolute, true, mathematical time of itself and by its own nature flows equably without relation to anything external. <coughs> but he said it with a British accent. So that's the arrow of time. Was it Newton? <laughs> it doesn't like Newton? <laughs> so the intuition is the same. That's our intuition as well, right? Our intuition is that the arrow of time basically flows continuously. And of course, on the view that you sample the perceptual world, it must be that what we're really doing is we're granulating at some others. We have a sampling rate. So that means, and what's really, really going on, which I just told you, is that it's probably like this. That is, you have multiple sampling rates. They're not arbitrary, and uh, the question is if something, then if this is what's really going on, then our, intuit our intuitive experience of the flow of time is actually illusory. That is, when you look under the hood, it's something that's much more uh, punctate and sampled, and uh, digitized, and discretized, and this is really a you know, pure perceptual illusion. So if this is on the right track, then I owe you, I will not subject you to this, but I, but I could, I would owe you evidence for what is the size of the little, small temporal integration windows? What is the size of big ones? Do they interact and what do they do? And the point is, and I'm gonna give you just a couple of quick examples just to you know, give you a flavor of the experiments, but the idea is that at this small scale, the short integration window is in fact on the order of 20, 30 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds. It's related to the low gamma rhythm and it turns out that at this scale, you can actually rever reverse signals of all kinds without paying a price. That means at this scale, you look at the signal in a way, you know, like from the top down, you don't care if you're looking at it like this or like this. You just extract something and you, need to, you don't actually care about its local order, about its phase, but at this scale, you really do. So that's the, that's the claim. So the, te the, experience, the temporal structure of perceptual experience is quantized on multiple scales. Okay, a couple of examples to wake you up. Yes, Bruno. Uh, how do you know that it's only two? Because you seem to assume, I mean, it could be two. Uh, it's more than two. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just talking about two. Okay. It's more than, I mean, this, but it's not, well, okay. Let me, 
Well, porosity is a phenomenon, not a scale. But porosity is going to be carried by this elaborate scale. But there's, so the issue is this. Is it a continuous distribution or a uniform distribution of all possible scales, which is the null hypothesis? Or is there actually sampling at particular predefined scales? And so I'm advocating the latter. I think it's actually not a uniform distribution. You don't sample all intervals equally. And I have a bunch of evidence for that, which I don't think I'm going to talk about. But let me give you a couple of little examples to give you a feeling for this stuff. So let's take the simplest possible uh, stimulus for the auditory system, the most boring, a click train. So let, let me play a few for you. And you tell me your, well, since you don't talk, you won't say anything. Right. Da, 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 da. You got that? Yeah. Right. So the stimulus onset asynchrony was 200 milliseconds. Or something like that, so. You can count that. So any drummer can do that. So now let's make them a little faster. Construction guy. <laughs> right. Okay, so let's make them even a little faster and see what happens. Because now you can't count anymore, but it's beginning to feel a little bit different. You're getting a bit of a pitch, perhaps. This has a clear pitch. And so does this, of course. OK. Now remember, it's always the same stimulus. You're not doing it. All you're doing is changing the uh, spacing between these clicks. But at some point, you take clicks, and you put them together, and you interpret them differently. So when the clicks are few and far between, you interpret this as basically a discrete uh, series of things. When they're very close, like in this case, the obnoxious one, you interpret that like a tone. It's almost like a sine wave. But in the middle, there's something weird happening. And it's exactly there where a whole range of phenomena appear. And if you ask people to do it psychophysically, uh, so you know, for instance, here's the tone-like thing. People say, it's never discrete. This is just like a tone, continuous, 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 continuous. And when they're very long, it's discrete. And then there's a very sharp boundary where people interpret the information as sort of ambiguous. And if you actually do electrophysiological recordings, you can do EEG, MEG, you name it, it turns out that the phenomena you see here look quite different than on the sides. So there's a different regime of processing right at that intermediate sweet spot. So for instance, it looks something like this. So when, you get a, when it's discrete, you get a pulse, you get a big broadband. This is a wavelet analysis, by the way. So this is time, this is one over frequency. You get a big uh, burst at each click, right? So the brain says, yes. Yes, yes. When it's continuous, you just get a big response to the onset, a little broader response. And it's, but when it's at this intermediate region, you get actually something a little more complicated. It's the interaction between the frequency you drive in and the mid latency response and so on. It doesn't matter what it is. So there's something very particular about this number, run, you know, 20 to 30 milliseconds, where you get very different perceptual phenomena. So you get the emergence of pitch, for instance. Something else you get exactly at this number, 25 to 30 milliseconds, is the so-called order threshold. The order threshold is if I give you two clicks, you know, like high, low, like click and <laughs> click, click. And I ask you, and I shift them against each other and say, which one came first? Uh, if it's above 25 milliseconds, your performance is perfect. If you're below 25 milliseconds, you can't tell. But you can tell that they're different. That is, they're not simultaneous. It's above this threshold of simultaneity, but it's below the order threshold. So this is a very you know, important perceptual threshold. Very classic papers from the 1950s by Hirsch and Sherrick. And it turns out that this particular threshold of you know, 20 to 30 milliseconds is true across modalities. It's the same for the visual modality, the auditory modality, and somatosensory modality. This should be surprising to you because, of course, at the periphery, they're very different. That is, their time constants at the, at the encoding of the periphery is not the same. The auditory system, for instance, is quite fast. The visual system at this is quite slow. But when you look at the cortical integration, they all use this time constant. So that's kind of OK, so there's order thresholds, uh, the direction of which uh, sweep is that. You know, can you tell <whistles> something like that? Uh, 25 milliseconds. Form and transitions are at that rate and so on. Now, how about a completely different example? One that you all know and love, but because you love it, let's hear it one more time. <laughs> 
I think all of you have probably seen this. So this is the part where you, cl okay, close your eyes. Close your eyes and tell me your bank account numbers. Okay, don't peek, don't peek. Listen to what you hear. Ha. Okay, you got that? What was it? Correct, gold star. One more time for verification. Close your eyes or I'll beat you. Ha. Okay, now open your eyes. Uh-oh, that doesn't look good. <laughs> okay, open your eyes, look at the screen, look at the, look at the lady, same, just one more time for verification, make sure we get it right. What are you hearing? Ha. Okay, what do you hear now? That's, that's not good. Close your eyes again. Pa. Still pa. Open your eyes again. Pa. Okay, so you can see it's extremely, you know, it's a very powerful, simple illusion, and everyone uses it all the time. McGurk and McDonald, 1976. Okay, so how can we use this for our present purposes? Um, and what does this have to do with integration? So a former graduate student of mine, Virginie van Wassenhove, used, did the following experiment. Um, since this is such a powerful illusion, that is when you see the face and you hear, so remember what happened here. The audio track was always pa, and the video track was always ka. But you, you, you never report ka, it's essentially, you never go with the video, which is weird because the video is veridical. That's what's actually there. So the stimulus is really the woman saying ka, and it's really the woman saying pa, the audio track, and yet you hear something that's not there. So you, it's a, like one line proof of the internal construction of the experience. Now what Virginie said is, but let's use that as a trick to test the limits of auditory uh, visual integration for speech. So she did the ex following very painful experiment, painful for subjects, not for me. Um, she had people sit there and she, sh she shifted against each other the stimulus onset asynchrony of the audio and the video. So you'd be sitting there and then sometimes you see the face go, pa, or you know, pa and over many, many different values. <laughs> so this is extremely boring. And your task is simply identification. So you say, what did you hear? And uh, this is, I think, a paper from 2007 or something like that. I don't know if I have the, these are old slides. So this is what you find. So this is the identification task. So you, you, see, the, you see the two things, an audiovisual stimulus, and your job is, what did you hear? Push the button. And here's the, this line here is the video, visually driven response, right? So, this is, so on the x-axis is the stimulus onset asynchrony. On the left side is when the audio comes first. So the left side is the case of pa. Right? And here it's the other way around. Um, you never report the video. It's interesting. Even though it's there and it's veridical and it's a compelling clear signal. And um, here is the audio alone. So this is actually the correct one. This is what you should say because you're coming to my lab and you know it's an auditory lab. You should be listening carefully and reporting the audio signal. But you only give 80%. It's actually pretty remarkable, even out here. So then it declines in the middle and it goes up. Now in this range here are the fusion responses. So this is the fusion rate over which people actually genuinely say they hear ta, even though it's not there at all. And you can do all kinds of games and correct it. And so here's a true bimodal response. So there's a pretty broad range over which you say that you heard an integrated percept, even though physically it's clearly not. And I just told you two minutes ago that your thresholds for this kind of timing are like 25 milliseconds. So you have no problem telling the order between these things. So by virtue of having a speech, a visual speech signal and an audio speech signal, you take much longer, or you allow, you're much more permissive in allowing more time to bind them into an integrated representation. Right, so there's a, Virginie's done many, many experiments on this, but so when I saw this, since I, I grew up on the Hirsch and Cherik stuff, this, you know, 25 milliseconds is king. So Virginie comes in and shows me this, and I'm like, that can't possibly be true. You know, that's irrational. So she had to do it again. <laughs> this time we said, let's do a simpler experiment. <laughs> 
let's just do simultaneity detection. So you do the same materials, and as a participant, you have to just simply say which one came first. Very easy, you know, people are very good at that. So just pu push the button here, and what you get is the same kind of thing. So this is just, uh, we had congruent and incongruent ones, so you're obviously uh, most permissive for congruent. The point is, though, that the plateau over which you integrate is very broad. It's not a peak of 20 milliseconds. And if you look at across all experiments, you know, many different versions, you see the window size goes between 150 and 250 or something like that. Okay, so that's weird because it means that even though your perceptual system can resolve temporal information at the scale of tens of milliseconds, when you're confronted with the real, with the multi-sensory case, you, you're at 250 milliseconds. So much, much broader, even though it's, it conflicts with this. So what's the message of that? Well, it looks like, and actually that speaks to Bruno's question, so there's many different integration constants, but there's two that are particularly potent here and that deal with, and that turn out to be important for speech. One is this very short one, I think, 20, 30, 40, something like that, and one is significantly longer, and these have to do not just with speech stuff, but also with non-speech. So for instance, the long integration constant, that's the time constant you need for loudness. So when you actually want to give a loudness judgment, that's a 200 millisecond time constant judgment. So there's many phenomena. So the conjecture is, well, you actually use these concurrently, but you do different kind of stuff. So there's you know, reasons to believe this. Now, last part, because I think this is actually a factoid that's useful and important. So what does this have to do with really the kind of aspect of speech that you must have access to if you want to successfully perceive the world? So um, a couple of us in the lab um, have been working on trying to figure out just statistically what's actually the modulation rate of speech and also music. So this is with Neiding and Ani Patel. Um, because there's lots of claims about what's the mean rate of speech and speech differs in this and that and the other way. But we want to actually know for real by looking at huge corpora, not just 10 sentences or you know, two examples from French and two from Serbo-Croatian, but like gigantic corpora. So we started, and we've done it now for many languages, we started with a Mandarin, English, and French, in part because there are uncertain theoretical notions, ideas that they're typologically distinct. And so that's one reason to choose those. And so here's again our example spectrograms, right? So it's time, frequency, and then you see the dark outline is the envelope, the amplitude envelope. So that's the energy, right? It's changing, blah. And what we did with these is to calculate the so-called modulation spectrum. So the modulation spectrum is basically how much does the sound go up and down, right? So the energy variation. And so the way to do this is you can calculate a broadband version as you look over the entire signal, or you do it more like the ear does it, namely by channel. So you have channel by channel, you separate them out, and you calculate the narrowband modulation spectrum, you sum, you know, you sum it for all the things. So what's, now, what's the mean rate of speech if you look at now hundreds of hours of speech, not just 10 examples? Well, it's, what, what do you think it is? How, how fast or slow is speech? in terms of its energy rate. Any guesses? I'm going to give you the definitive answer. <laughs> the syllable rate. Now what is the syllable rate? Three to eight hertz. Three to eight, that's very permissive, OK. That's a good guess. You're not allowed to play. <laughs> Experts aren't allowed to play. That three to eight is a, is a very good guess. Did you, were you one of the reviewers of submissions A through F? <laughs> Rejected number D, <laughs> you rejected D. <laughs> um, so here it is, for instance, for the entire Timid corpus, the switchboard corpus, the Buckeye corpus, and a bunch of audio books. So this is now only English, so different kinds of things. And you can see there's a clear peak, and the peak is between four and five, and it's actually very narrowly tuned in the rates that you say. That's, you were there, you were reviewer number three. You're, 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 you're toast. <laughs> okay, so very narrowly distributed. So this is what the ear must deal with and what the brain must deal with. This is, so sometimes you're a little faster, sometimes you're a little slower. We also, by the way, know that intelligibility sharply declines if you go, for instance, you cannot go above nine. You fall apart. So it's really two to nine is sort of the rate at which you can have intelligibility. So this is the peak of the modulation spectrum for 
you know, hours and hours and hours of English. You can put this one in the back. This is for reals. Here it is now for the different languages. They're supposedly distinct in a way that they, you might expect some shifts in their peak, but it's also, when you look at a larger corpus, because it has to do basically with the up and down of the mouth, same rate. So it's between four and five hertz. So now, this does not directly mean that that's syllabic rate, because syllables are a little bit more complicated than just the physics of the modulation spectrum, but there's a very interesting correlation of that, right? So, so that is actually the mean rate of speech, and you can, I don't know if I have the music case here too. Music is actually very interesting. Uh, it's a slightly more broadband and has a peak that's at about two hertz, which is actually 120 beats per minute, which is interesting. We did many different corpora speed of, of that as well. Okay, so that's the physics of the signal, right? That's the physics of speech, just what you get. You record you know, boring things and you calculate this and you can really you can get a very concrete number. Now you might say, well, that's interesting, but what does that have to do with the linguistics of speech that I have to decode because my job isn't to hear blah, you know, up and down. My job is to actually turn it into something that I can then use for the next uh, operation I'm doing. So it turns out to have you know, a very nice relation it's not a full map, but a very close uh, correlation with, with syllabic rate. And um, that's not surprising. So here, for instance, is an example of, from the olden days, John Ohala, a very distinguished phonetician and phonologist from Berkeley, um, recording himself 10,000 times his jaw opening and closing and reading. So he wired himself, you know, that's how people used to do it. Not this kind of wussy, like, oh, I'll do it in MATLAB. Like, every morning, go to the lab and work for an hour on yourself. That's cool. Okay, so the mean duration of open closure is there. Here is a very uh, large corpus from the uh, Phonetics Institute in Munich for mean syllable duration in German. And um, here is the here is Japanese English. Here is the modulation spectrum. And then here is actually a relatively influential paper from a few years ago by Pellegrino in uh, the journal Language for Mandarin, German, English, Italian, French. Uh, I think it's. Brazilian, Portuguese, or something, something like that, and Japanese. This is now syllable rate expressed as syllables per second. Right? So, and the message of this paper was look at the wide variation, how fascinating, how different languages are. Right? So it goes from 5.2 to 7.2. My message is, yes, that's actually very interesting, but that's not, from a biological system point of view, different at all. That's actually remarkably consistent. Not, so I'm more impressed by the similarity than the difference of that, although, of course, we. We want to acknowledge the differences because they have very different internal syllable structures, which of course you're sensitive to as you have, that's what you have to learn. So anyway, so there's a close mapping between the acoustics of speech, the modulations, and syllable duration. Why is this useful? Okay, well now we get to the, you, know, you want to decode the signal. So my last example, is, I'm almost done, right? Is it, I'm supposed to be 10 minutes or something? So let me give you one, you know, two, two final things to take. So here's, a, if, if I'm right, that you really analyze things on multiple scales, and if the syllable rate really matters, you know, something that you really analyze, then, you know, how do I actually analyze a, a speech signal? Do I actually go slice by slice in the small case, or slice by slice in the big case, and how do I put them together? So of course, the idea I'm going to push, obviously, is that it's like the visual system, because I always steal everything from the visual system. In the visual system, you can record, for instance, let's say you're in the same receptive field. And so I'm a monkey, and I'm sitting here, and I'm looking at the poster. And I'm some receptive field here in the upper left quadrant. And I'm recording, let's say, from area V4. And because I'm a really good physiologist, also from MT at the same time, and I happen to find the same receptive field. So that same receptive field gets a very different treatment by those cells, right? So for instance, the cells in MT are very phasic, so they go bang, right? So they give you a very quick analysis of that particular uh, information in the receptive field. Whereas uh, responses in area V4 have a much longer, they go brrrr. Right? So same, same, receptive, same little visual array, but you're looking at it through very different kind of firing properties, and I'm basically gonna steal the same thing. So I'm gonna say, well, you must analyze the subsegmental information, basically featural information, segmental information. If you don't do that, you can't get lexical access correct, because you need the order information, otherwise it doesn't work. 
At the same time, you must have suprasegmental information because as Nina said, you've to have got to have prosody come out, otherwise you can't analyze that part of the signal. So you must also analyze this, so syllabicity, you know, tonal information, and so on. So if that's true that they're done separately, there must be a binding process. That is, they must then be mapped on top of each other to then get you something that goes to the next stage. And so here's a first experiment. This was actually published, I think, this year. This was a Maria Chait, who's a former student. She's now a professor in London. So here's the game we play. Here's a sentence. You got that, probably? Okay, so. so here's the game we play. Oh, I, I shouldn't have played you that. That's a shame. So we take, it's fun the other way. So we take an original signal. Now we do something that the ear more or less does, that is we decompose it into channels. And a bunch of, in this case, non-overlapping channels, so for you know, low frequency channels. So this is like critical bands, okay? so decompose the thing. Bunch of different channels. Then within each channel, this is what an ear does, right? So it takes different information, just like spatial frequency channels in the visual system. You extract the fine structure and the envelope. Right, so this is what I showed you very much at the beginning. So the amplitude envelope, like this is like the peak of the modulation spectrum, and the details of the fine structure. You extract those, then you do some manipulations, basically some filtering, which results in this, and at the end you put them all back together. And what you get is, for instance, you can make a signal that contains only low frequency information. This has been done before, very famously in the 90s by Rob Drollman and people. So, this is the blue lines here. So a signal like this only has this low frequency information, modulation information, right? Not frequency of the signal, it's how fast it modulates. Or you can do something funky like this. So you only have stuff in the you know, putative gamma band. So I don't know which example I have here, but this is what it sounds like. So here's the experiment's intelligibility. You listen to this junk, and your job is transcribe it. Okay, this is super tricky. Here's what it sounds like. <laughs> okay, so you should be like, thanks. When do I get my 10 bucks? Um, okay, so that's a typical intelligibility experiment. Uh, and, well, how do you think you do when you listen to this? Like shit, right? Yeah, except you don't. <laughs> that's the thing. You actually do pretty well. This is like dreadful. Okay, so now here's your performance. It's actually really good. <laughs> this is almost 20%. I mean, you, there's a huge learning effect. So the first trials are terrible, but at the end you're pretty good. So you get you know, 15, 20% of just the high, so that's this modulation right here. So the signal only contains this junk, very rapid modulations. Everything else is filtered out. You're pretty good, you can transcribe that much. Isn't that amazing? Because you, there's sufficient cues that you can actually bootstrap into the intelligibility system. Now, what about if you only have the low modulation frequency? How do you do? <laughs> better? Much better. Okay, so that was the original finding. So the original finding of Drollman's had been that you're actually 40, 50, actually we, it's almost the same values we got. So Drollman had a series of papers about this, of smearing of the envelope. So you do pretty well. So this basically contains only cues to syllabicity. Right? So the fine structure is not muck with, but you have cues to syllabicity. So you actually get about half of the response, you know, half of, is, is pretty good for such a horrible signal. Okay, now comes the critical issue. What if you hear the two together? If you get both the high and the low, what could happen? I mean, they're both shitty signals, let's face it. <laughs> so are you, so, Here's my guess. Here are my different guesses. Uh, you just follow the low, if you're smart, because that's the better signal, gives you the better cues. So when you have the two together, you should go with the one that gives you the better information. You know. Or worse, you could get destructive interference. You have shitty signal one and shitty signal two. By probability summation, you get shitty signal three. You know, so you get bad cue integration. So you should do worse when you get the two together. Or the kicker, you do better, okay? They're, they add up, and the real kicker is they actually have an interaction that is a super additive. It's not just that they add, they add more than, the, more than linearly, and that is, in fact, the answer. So when you give the two together, 
you get actually, uh, this is the linear combination, the prediction of the linear combination of the two signals, and your actual performance actually exceeds even that. So you have two crappy signals, but they're, they provide exactly the kind of information that when you add them on top of each other, they provide sufficient cues to initiate lexical access and then the subsequent intelligibility operations. That's pretty cool. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. So it says dichotic. Yeah, we did it mon monotically and dichotically, yeah. So do you have any difference if you present? Yeah, we, yeah, that was the, that was the, uh, I naively thought initially that that was gonna be the really great thing, but then retrospectively that was not the right idea and because it's an offline intelligibility task and the, you would only get those effects online if you do it right away, but here you hear the thing, you have a while, you sit down and you type it in and by that time the ear differences affects, yeah, I mean, it's, so that's the problem. So you really want an online version of this. But yeah, that's the, that was the hope, actually. That was exactly what we were trying to go for. Okay, so, but this is pretty neat, right? So it means that you use this information that's at the syllabic scale and the information at the segmental scale, even in a crappy signal, in a way to add up. So how do you train people to do this? Because just hearing the examples that you gave us. You, you, get, you get better after like five minutes. You don't train them at all. You give them 10 examples at the beginning of the session, then they go through this horrible experiment, and if you look at trials, you know, the first 20 trials, your performance is pretty crappy, and then your performance just goes up and then plateaus at whatever that is. Pretty, I mean, your, your perceptual learning, especially with materials that you know require intelligibility, is just incredibly powerful. I know what Simon's doing in the bar tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now, last couple of points to wrap this thing up. So this is simply an experiment to, to sort of try to convince you that it's reasonable to think about this multi-time resolution way in an online way. It's not just sort of an abstraction. Really, that these are scales of information that interact in a, in a synergistic way to generate the percept. Now, a couple of sort of meta points on this. First of all, the same scales obtain in vision. So a very <laughs> lovely review paper by Alex Holcomb from a few years ago took an inventory of a bunch of phenomena of dynamic vision and tried to actually find what are the, the time scales of that. It will not surprise you that you know, I whipped this slide out because it aligns exactly with the time scales. Of that. So it's interesting and that's probably why it ties to the same underlying you know, uh, oscillatory mechanisms ultimately. So you get the same uh, fast and long time constants. So these are the fast ones and these are the slow ones. Okay, that's pretty interesting. Um, now, last point. Uh, this is all very nice and good. How might you implement this? So the way I've been thinking about this is as temporal integration windows that are much more broadly distributed. So this I have actually thought about a fair amount. So suppose you have um, windows, so, you know, populations of cells in, in auditory cortex that have a preferred time constant that's pretty short. Let's say it's you know, on the order of 25 milliseconds. So it reflects some, you know, some you know, low gamma band time constant and another population that's much longer, let's say under, you know, somewhere in the middle of the thing, four hertz. Uh, okay, that's fine, so that's what you see. So you have cells optimized for different things, and suppose you have another population on the other side that also does that, but let's say the proportions are a little bit different. There's a slight asymmetry in the proportions of information. So they both analyzed, and of course these are distributions, right? These are not like, you know, it's not a digital clock, it's distributions of cells that sample differently. So this is the idea. So you have distributions of cells sampling or discretizing the information at different time scales. If that's on the right track, then you start out, the information comes into your ears, and you get a pretty symmetric, so you get basically like a high quality recording. You get a good CD in your head. So you record all the information, you got a great CD, then you take that information and you resample it twice. And you resample it once on a pretty fast scale. So you go chop, 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 chop. And you sample it a second time, chop, chop, chop. With, you know, over interdigitated but different populations of cells. What is the, you know, what is meaning of this? The functional consequence is that these give you the high temporal resolution that you need for those tasks. And these give you the resolution that you need for long tasks, like the intonation contour stuff of prosody. So closely related cellular populations, maybe slightly asymmetrically distributed, give you the range of temporal phenomena you have to deal with. So that's how you get this non-overlap. So that's, uh, 
I did not, so I wrote about this a long time ago in 2001 first, and it's called asymmetric sampling in time, I called it then. I did not follow this research program at all, <laughs> but other people did. And I myself have remained until recently pretty agnostic on this, but it's actually it has a fair amount of empirical support as it turns out. And I'll give you as a last, you know, just an example. So if this is true, if there are in fact such populations, then they shouldn't just be driven into the system by the stimulus properties, but they should be intrinsic, right? So they should be just sitting there, the brain should be breathing at those rates. So this is an old study that Anne Lise and I did, a kind of crazy study. He wanted to remain anonymous, but I'll tell you it's Andreas Kleinschmidt. So, and so what we did here is we took, uh, we did two experiments, the same experiment twice, an EEG fMRI experiment, right? So we're wanting to test, are there really such, you know, are there such populations and are they asymmetric? So we stick a volunteer with EEG uh, into the machine and record the EEG and the fMRI, but the point is we do the following analysis. You take the EEG signal, so this is at rest, there's nothing happening, right? This is like, you know, at rest means you're, you're doing your shopping list, you're dry cleaning, you know, you're worrying about your bills. So you take the EEG signal, yeah, here it is. It's a continuous EEG recording the whole time, and periodically you record whole brain MRI, right? So you're just sitting there, now, the EEG signal we take and we filter into the frequency bands that we just hypothesized, right? So the low gamma, a low gamma proportion, and a theta proportion. Now we take that, so we filter the EEG signal, then we convolve that with the hemodynamic response function that we know from fMRI, and then we use that as a regressor to probe the MRI data. And then the question is, where do you find the blobs? And, you know, we found the blobs where they belong. <laughs> so we did this experiment. Probably he was reviewer number three again. Oh, this is old. This was when you were a little boy. <laughs> um, so this is primitive fMRI by your standards. But it was in the olden days. Um, first, we did this at 1.5 Tesla. And you see, here's the correlation with the higher <laughs> frequency, and here it is with the lower frequency. That's pretty neat. So it's actually, they're both there, but they're asymmetric in the predictive direction, which is very quirky, because you wouldn't believe it. But then we did have reviewer number three who said, but we know about asymmetry and handedness and so on. You really should do it the following way. You should only have right-handed males, because males are more lateralized by some myth, and right-handers are the way to go. So this must have been someone from the kind of traditional old neuropsychology literature, probably. This cost me 50,000 bucks, this little reviewer number three, by the way. So we did it again at three Tesla this time, and we get the same thing again. So we're like, yeah, I got, got that. Okay, but now you're an fMRI person, you're gonna say, no way in hell do you do an fMRI study and you only find these blobs. That's just not how the world works. You know, you should be so lucky. You know, how much filtering and how much tweaking of your thresholds did you do? So you might ask yourself, where else in the brain would you find this activation correlated with these things? And the answer is in the motor system, exactly there where you articulate. All right, so this is the uh, jaw and tongue area of the motor system, again, in both experiments. Now I really got you. <laughs> so why is that good? Because it means that you basically turn, it, it gives you a common temporal currency for the interaction between those parts of the motor system responsible for articulation and those parts of the auditory system that actually deal with that information. So it gives you like temporal brain euros or something like that. Right? So you want to be on a time scale that's commensurate both with the different scales of the output system and the analytic input system. So I think that's pretty neat. Uh, last, I will not tell you about this, even though it's fabulously exciting. Last point, because I'm hungry, is um, to re I want to relate this. So, you know, what, what, what is the point of this, sort of the, the, the um, macro message? So I keep talking about these slower oscillations, faster oscillations. How do these hang together? I mean, what logistical function do they actually serve for this? And so Anneliese and I have been obsessing about this for some years, and we actually disagree about, it, about half of the ideas, but we still love talking to each other about it. And so we have our consensus view at the moment, a heart-fought consensus, 
is that um, there's something missing here. This should be the speech waveform. Okay. So, wait, does that have the. Okay, it's not there. Well, what's the tricky thing about a speech waveform that you've seen you know, the last few days? Well, it's a continuous signal, uh, which gives you no clear boundaries of where stuff is. Like, unlike text, there is no little white spaces, right? That's one of the really hard problems that the learner faces, that we face in a second language. If you don't know the vocabulary, it's a pain in the ass to segment information. So how do you do that? You get a continuous signal, and you want to add the white spaces. So this is one way to think about this. What you do is, there's a spectrotemporal encoding, which we started with here, right? So you get all this information out. That information gets shuttled up you know, the various brainstem nuclei, and it interacts with two kinds of phenomena. There's intrinsic, so I just showed you in the fMRI study, there's intrinsic populations of cells that are basically breathing at different rates. So there's, for instance, a slow oscillation, say roughly in the theta band, and much faster ones. And the conjecture we have is that the input signal, that is stimulus-driven uh, spike trains from the periphery that basically initially arrive at layer four of uh, downstream areas, actually reset the phase of these intrinsic oscillations. As they say, now it's zero, now it's zero. So they're basically like edges, right? They're edges to do things. So why, why is that useful? Because for instance, take this, low, take this lower frequency oscillation. What that does is if it resets its phase to particularly useful edges in the stimulus, this should be the waveform up here, then it basically allows you to track the signal. Like it tracks the phase of the signal. It's like the wave of the brains rides the wave of the speech. It's a phase tracking of the signals. You, you sit exactly on top of that. So that's super useful because you get a pretty direct readout of that. And we know the modulations give you a relationship to syllables. Now it turns out that these things are very strongly coupled. So the low frequency and the higher frequency are coupled or nested in a particular way. That in turn changes the excitability of when you have spiking in these areas. So what's the net output is you end up with little decodable packages of information as you've inserted the white spaces. I mean, the metaphor is that you've put, you've said this is the information I've segmented, this is what I have to decode. So I start with a pretty coarse syllabic representation, and then I know exactly where to fire, and I can align my firing with where it's relevant in the speech waveform. So the oscillations sit there, they're just some intrinsic, they're just excitability cycles, there's nothing magical, there's just the brain going along. But the question, do, do they have any causal force, or are they just epiphenomenal? And I'm just gonna say, look, they can have causal force by, insofar as they're reset, tracking the speech faithfully by sitting on top of it. That is the role. So to give it the kind of a cartoon or summary is that it's a parsing mechanism. It says, so real speech is like this. She had your dark suit and greasy washer water all year. So it looks like that, and it's very difficult to parse, right? So parsing means making chunks. And the idea is you record it, they lock exactly to the envelope of the speech signal. We just heard that the envelope gives you very useful cues for syllabicity. And if that's true, then what it functionally means is it goes like this. So what, the, what that has accomplished is basically giving you cues where to look for the next decoding stage. So you have a parsing stage, and now you have actually a way to, you know, where to look for decoding. So that's the, that's the conjecture. To what degree is this? Because in, in one sense you say it's intrinsic, but at the same time here it looks like it's untrained. Um, well, the oscillations are intrinsic. Yeah, but, the, the but then it's in, but the stimulus entrains the, the phase entrains the intrinsic oscillation, right? So it's an interface between the, so the exact, input train. The exact frequency within the feeder range can then can, then can vary. vary yes. Can vary between. Uh, so we have a lot of data on this. Can vary between about two to nine hertz, but not outside of that. So it's flexible. It's not a clock like that, but it's, but it, and it's of course driven by exactly edges in the stimulus. So it can vary around that, but not outside that. And that's actually the rate limiting step there. So that is the idea. Okay. So what I've tried to tell you is that um, so speech processing is fractionated in the spatial domain. This is what we started out with. There's this, you know, multiple areas that have to be orchestrated, both to recover the meaning that you're trying to get and to recover the articulatory commands you might need. And it's also fractionated in the time domain in a way that you use multiple temporal, you know, different granularity of temporal representations to decode the signal. 
And to achieve all this, sort of my repeated message is that I take that as the challenge to figure out, you know, how do you write that code? Right? What is it that you put into the thing that allows you to do all those things? And that, I have the vaguest idea. And we have, you know, hypotheses, but that's a really a problem that requires the intersection of, you know, neurophysiology, computer science, linguistics, psychology, and everything, because it's a really hard, you know, it's, a it's conceptually simple, but very hard to figure out the nitty gritty. So. And I think that's enough. Thank you for staying. Thank you for sometimes paying attention. Thank <laughs> you.